This video is sponsored by Rosetta Stone. Slang. Crisps. Workers' rights. Police. Maybe. 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 I guess we are about to find out. <laughs> hey guys, I'm Eric. And I'm Grace. We're the Wandering Ravens. We're a couple of Americans with a deep passion for all things British, and today we are coming at you from the United States, where we currently are, with a list of things that the UK does better than the USA. But before we dive into the video, make sure you subscribe to our channel and give this video a thumbs up so that YouTube can promote it and more people can learn about the wondrous glories of the UK. And by hitting the like button, you prove that British people are better at smashing the like button than Americans. So we've already made a video about things that the UK does better than the USA, but we've been here for about seven months now, and that video was after only being here for a few weeks. So the list has grown. So today we are updating our list with more things that the United Kingdom does better than the United States of America. The first entry on our list has to do with workers' rights. Let's talk about which country gets better sick leave. Here in the USA, sick leave laws change depending on which state you are in. So here in Washington state, you can accrue one hour of paid sick leave per 40 hours worked. And sick leave beyond that is unpaid. So how much does an American, or at least a Washingtonian, actually make with sick leave? So so let's say you max it out every year, you take your full 52 hours of sick leave, then based on the median hourly wage, which is about $25, you'd be making $1,300 a year from sick leave. So, I mean, it's not bad. It's just you don't get very much yeah. of it. You get 52 hours max. Across the pond in the UK, statutory sick pay income provides up to 28 weeks of paid sick leave. Of course, the one caveat is that the income that you're making during that time is significantly lower than in the United States. So whereas you're getting paid your regular hourly wage in the States, mm -hmm. in the UK, you're going to be making just 95 pounds, 85 pence per week. So in total, if you're going to be maxing out your time off in the UK, you're going to be making 2,683 pounds, which is a lot more than you get from time off in the U in the USA. Mm -hmm. so, but I guess if you divide it up by hourly, it would not be. Hourly would be pretty bad. Although it would be impossible in the US to take 28 weeks off. <laughs> yeah, so that's the nice thing. That's, that's where the UK pulls ahead here, is you guys have the flexibility and the ability to take that time off if you want it, even if you're not really getting paid that much while doing it. Whereas here, you would just be unemployed. If you're an employee who has ever taken sick leave in either the UK or the USA, do make sure to stop by the comments and let us know what your experience was like. Did these numbers match your experience or did we get anything wrong? The next thing that the UK does better than the USA is paid time off. Ooh, yeah, this is a category where the UK blows the US out of the water. No competition, unfortunately, because in the UK, people who work five days a week or, you know, a full-time job are guaranteed 28 days of paid leave every year. That's almost six weeks of paid time off per year, which is insane to us. Like, I can't even imagine what I would do with that much time <laughs> so off. So much time off. What do you guys do with all that time off? As you can tell from our reactions, the situation here is quite dire. Employers are not required legally to give any paid time off to their employees at all. Not at all. Not even holidays. It's a bit sad. Not even Christmas? Not even Christmas. Really? Yeah. If you, your employer wants to make you work Christmas, you work Christmas. Wow. Bob Cratchit. Of course, many employers do choose to give time off as a benefit because they want to get employees that way. For example, Amazon, which is a local company here in Seattle, gives salaried employees somewhere between 10 to 15 days off per year. So you guys get double the time off working just a minimum wage job in the UK than like a full-time high upper level salaried Amazonian. Amazon corporate <laughs> employee. Wow. Yeah. I think we need to move to the UK. <laughs> <laughs> and while we're on the topic of workers' rights, let's talk about paid maternity and paternity leave, because this is another thing that the UK does better than the USA. As of 2020, Washington State now offers up to 12 weeks of paid maternity and paternity leave. Depending on how much you make, you'll be paid either 50 or 90% of your regular income during your leave. This is actually really generous and way better than most states. So is this then like a scale? like? you'll get paid between 50 and 90 percent or is that mm -hmm. set numbers like you either make 50 percent or 90 percent because those seem kind of like <laughs> yeah, odd numbers. kind of odd numbers from what i read it is uh not a scale you either get 50 or 90 percent and the way they estimate that is if you make over the average monthly income mm -hmm. then you get the 50 percent because you're a high income earner you don't need that much and then if you make under the monthly average you get 90 percent because you're a low income earner you need as much as you can get. Okay, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah. And the nice thing about this is, 
at least in this state, both mother and father can take time off. Okay, yeah, that's what I was gonna ask next. Is it like 12 weeks and you have to split it between the two of them or is no. it 12 weeks for each parent? I think it's 12 weeks for each. That so it's really good. really good. <laughs> yeah, and this is new. So this is like cutting edge workers' rights legislation here in the United States. So what's the situation like across the pond? Well, from what I understand, in the UK you can take up to 50 weeks of leave and 37 of those weeks will be paid time off. So that means that if you want to take up to 50 weeks, you can do that without having to worry about getting fired. Mm -hmm. but only 37 of those weeks you're going to get getting money for, right? Yeah. So the way the paid time off works in the UK is a little bit different than it does in the USA. Parents can choose to split them up between them, so one parent can take all 37 weeks, or they can split them up 50-50, so one parent gets 18 and a half weeks off, the other parent gets 18 and a half weeks off, and total they get paid for all of that time. But that's still much more paid time off than we get in the USA. From what we've read, the one downside to paid maternity and paternity leave in the UK is that the maximum payout is just 140 pounds per week, which if you consider that the median weekly wage in the UK is 585 pounds, that's not very much. It's actually, what, like 20% of your weekly income? Especially considering that you have a new baby in the household, which babies are really expensive. Yeah, it's like an 80% pay cut. So out of curiosity, do most British people take that full time off then? Because if I was there and I was gonna take an 80% pay cut, I don't think that I would take those 50 weeks off. Yeah. Or even the 37 weeks, I probably wouldn't want to do that just because like there's high incentive not to. That said, as with sick leave, the nice thing about maternity and paternity leave in the UK is that you guys have the option of taking it off if you want it. In the USA, someone might get fired for taking more time than what's allowed, but you guys get so much more extra time, up to 37 weeks of paid leave for one person. That's so much time. So I think this is still a category win for the UK just because you guys have the choice of staying at home or going back to work. I think nah. that's fair. One point for the UK. <laughs> also, if we're squinting a lot, don't worry. We're not squinting at you. It's just very bright out right now. We're not used to shooting videos in the yeah. backyard. <laughs> Despite being overcast, it is extremely bright yeah. out here. So yeah. That's the squinting. And the frowning, I'm sorry. On a lighter note, our next entry is crisps. Crisps. Yay. I love a good crisp. Apple crisp, especially. I think they would call that cobbler. <laughs> because you've eaten a lot more British crisps than I have, I will have to defer to you for this entry. So as you guys know, we've made a whole bunch of snack and crisp tasting videos on our channel. Make sure to click up here if you haven't seen those yet. But yeah, I think British crisps tend to be better than American crisps for a lot of different reasons, but the main one being less salty. Yes. Less salty. American crisps, you can only have a handful and then you have to drink a gallon of water because it's just so much salt. Mm -hmm. But in the UK, you know, it's salty but not too overwhelming. What do you think about the flavor selection? Because I'm sure that'll be one that people are like, what, oh, yeah. nothing about the flavor selection? <laughs> do you think that there's better flavors or a greater variety of flavors in the UK as opposed to the USA? Yeah, so when it comes to the spectrum of flavor, I think that the UK wins there as well because here our, our chips are pretty bog standard. You got your barbecue and your ranch and your sea salt vinegar and you know. That's kind of it, yeah. Yeah, your crisps. You don't really get those wild, wacky twiglet flavors or prawn oh. cocktail or pickled onion. And I'm just scratching the surface. There are so many wild flavors. I know, there's flavors. so many more. So crisps, chips, clear win the UK. If you're a Brit or an American that disagrees with me, Stop by the comments and we can fight it out. <laughs> Another thing that the UK does better than the USA is travel, with more Brits flying internationally than any other nationality on Earth. That's wow. a lot, that's yeah. super impressive. More Brits take to the skies and leave their country than Americans do, which is crazy considering just the population differences. I know. But despite all this jet setting, Brits are some of the worst in Europe when it comes to speaking foreign languages. So to help right this wrong and to help Brits have an easier time reserving their spot by the pool while on holiday, it's time to talk about today's sponsor, Rosetta Stone. Rosetta Stone is a fantastic language learning service that ensures that your brilliant British wit isn't lost in translation. So instead of saying, it's a bit wet outside, after some practice with Rosetta Stone, you can say, il fait un temps de chien. And instead of moaning out, I am totally and utterly car parked, <laughs> after a late night out on the town, you can cry out, j'ai mal au chevou. You have bad hair? It's an idiom, French idiom. For being. That means I have a hangover. Yeah, I'm drunk. 
plastered, gazeboed. We've been using Rosetta Stone to learn French because we actually want to move to France one day. And my favorite Rosetta Stone feature is the program's speech recognition capabilities. This has really helped me develop some good speaking habits and is getting me to sound more like a local and less like a tourist. Où est-ce que vous habitez? Où est-ce que vous habitez? But I'm too busy to learn a language, you say. Between work, commuting, and three hours a day of shoveling mama in my face, I couldn't possibly find the time. You say, we hear you. And so does Rosetta Stone, which is why their intuitive app is designed for busy people just like you. Whether you're at work, on the bus, or inhaling Marmite by the gallon, you'll be able to immerse yourself in your favorite language wherever you are. And to jumpstart your language learning, Rosetta Stone is giving all of our subscribers the opportunity to get lifetime access to all of their language learning courses for just 179 pounds. Spread over two years, that's less than two pounds per week for language learning, which is basically a robbery so don't miss out. To claim your lifetime unlimited subscription, click the link in the description of this video. Now, Ue Monte. The next thing that the UK does way, way better than the USA is slang. British slang ain't bad. That's highly offensive, I think. <laughs> so what are some of your favorite British slang phrases? I like the one, as much use as a chocolate teapot. Oh yeah. I really like that one, because I just, it's... It's something I've definitely never heard or even thought of before. So I was like, oh, that's random. I love it. And there's so many variations of that one too. Like as much use as a chocolate fire guard or as much use as an ashtray on a motorcycle. I have heard that one. If you know any other variations, let us know. I really liked half soaked for someone being a bit dim or slow. Uh, he's a bit half soaked. Or one sandwich short of a picnic. Isn't yeah. that one as well? Yep. As thick as two short planks. All of these are insults that we're going with. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, you guys are just better at doing the insults than we are. Way better. We're just like, you're a moron <laughs> and everyone hates you. And then of course the UK has things like Cockney rhyming slang, which is a whole just world of slang that we can't touch here in the United States. And so many brilliant uses of the word bollocks. I know. <laughs> yeah, that's not one that we ever really use at all. Yeah. Like that that word in and of itself is just not something we say we over here. We don't say the I word bollocks think. here at all. So I can say it with impunity. You know, how are you feeling today? Oh, feeling like a bag of bollocks. <laughs> Which I think it means feeling bad. It might mean feeling good, because sometimes like if something's the dog's bollocks and it's really good, so yeah, like but a like bag a of bag of them? <laughs> like that's that's a negative inherently one. negative. To drop a bollock. To be in the bollocky buff. What the heck? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so many of these I haven't heard. <laughs> bollocky buff means naked. Oh, um, can a woman be in the bollocky buff? You guys will have to answer that one for us. <laughs> So in the USA, we do have a lot of fun slang, but it just doesn't come close to the density and the amount of slang that there is in the UK. Or the level of intelligence. <laughs> the level of intelligence. Yeah. Wallachy buff. <laughs> Not to completely write off the USA, there are some fun slang expressions that we have. For example, where you guys use the word bollocks to mean a million different things, we use the word shit to mean a million like different, different things. things. Yeah, like you shoot the shit. I don't know if you do that in the UK. Do you shoot the shit? <laughs> Can you guys guess what it means? It's a very American phrase. It has the word shoot and shit in it. To be the shit. A good very thing. good thing. Or it's shit. But that's a bad thing. If it's some shit, good thing. To not but give a shit. Also a bad thing. It's the shit. Good thing. It's, it's horse shit. <laughs> bad. bad thing. But to give a shit. Good. It's a piece of shit. Bad. bad. It's hot shit. Good. Good. It ain't shit. Bad. Bad. It's very confusing. <laughs> Language is beautiful. If you guys have any favorite American or British slang expressions, make sure you share those with us down in the comments. The next thing that the UK does better, much, much, much better than the USA is food regulations. Yeah, it's been a bit of a pain to do shopping here. Every time we buy something, you have to pick up the can and check the ingredients to make sure there's no terrible carcinogens or additives. And in the UK, you don't really need to worry about that as much because a lot of the carcinogens and additives that we have over here are banned from British shores. The bleached chicken is coming though, so you better watch out. Yeah, chicken's gonna get you. <laughs> chicken's gonna get you. <laughs> bleached chicken specifically. <laughs> so what are some of the additives and stuff that we have here in the States that are banned in the UK? Kicking things off with carcinogens, BHT and BHA are both banned in the UK. There's a lot of food colorings, yellow five, yeah. yellow 
Six. Six. Red, Red 40. 40. Brominated vegetable oil. Mm. Potassium. Bromate? Bromate. Yeah, that's it. Potassium bromate. Additives like these have been shown to cause nerve damage, memory loss, white blood cell mutations, and cancer. Another thing that the UK does far better than the United States is road safety, and specifically roundabouts. I love how everywhere in the UK has a roundabout. You don't really have the four-way stop, the intersections, mostly roundabouts. Here, roundabouts are few and far between. We do have them. We should have a lot more of them. Intersections are scary. Four-way stops are really scary. And I, I think that's probably where a lot of the accidents happen are at intersections and things like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, someone's going through, someone runs a red light. Yeah. Tail. You're dead. You're dead. There it is. <laughs> Another thing that I hate about American roads are those lanes where you have traffic merging onto the highway and you also have traffic exiting the highway in the same lane. Same lane. So you have cars coming on and cars leaving from the same lane and it's just chaos. The next thing that the UK does better than the USA is, drum roll please, <laughs> police? Maybe? Maybe. Maybe. I guess we are about to find out. <laughs> <laughs> right off, we gotta say, we do not know a lot about this topic. We've done a little bit of research, but there is so much here. It is a cobweb of statistics and facts and figures and opinions. This is a layperson point of view. This is not making any sort of statements about anything. No, really. not really. <laughs> In the UK, we've heard people describe policing strategies there as kind of policing by consent which really mm -hmm. kind of sums up the differences between policing in the UK and USA. Based on our own personal experience, American police tend to be suspicious of everyone, whereas British police aren't opposed to drinking a pint at a street fair. Like we went to a couple of street fairs and stuff in the UK and definitely saw coppers out there drinking pints. What? And, and racist holster, from didn't my we? memory. Well, that memory may or may not be accurate, <laughs> but I feel like that's something I saw happen. From a consumer point of view, do you think it'd be safe to say that we would rather be arrested by British police and American police? Yes, I would prefer to not be arrested ever by anyone <laughs> for any reason, but I suppose so. And of course, we would love to hear your opinions on this topic. If you have ever been a cop in the USA or the UK, or you've done any amount of research on either of those, do let us know what your opinion is down in the, in the comments, because I know we have, a, we have a lot to learn here. And a bigger question, what would you guys add to this list of things that the UK does better than the USA? Make sure you let us know down in the comments what things the Brits do better than the Yanks. And uh, if- <laughs> Accents being one of them. Accents being one of them. Accent imitations. If you haven't already, make sure that you watch the other videos in the series linked right up here. And of course, a huge thank you to the patrons who support this channel. We couldn't do this video without you guys. And a special thank you to Winter and Danny. You guys are amazing and we appreciate you both. Again, I'm Eric. And I'm Grace. We're the Wandering Ravens. And we'll see you in the next video. Laters.